and welcome to our webinar. I would like to introduce today's speakers, Alex Cagnoni, Director of Authentication at WatchGuard, and our guest speaker, Rob Smithers, CEO at Mircom. Mircom is an independent organization focused on product testing with over 30 years of experience and is known for forming standardized testing programs in the technology space, having conducted validation reports for companies like Microsoft, Palo Alto, and Cisco, among others. Today, Alex and Rob will discuss multi-factor authentication from a competitive outlook and will walk you through the key features that leading MFA solutions are offering. All right, thank you, Liz. Thank, thanks everyone for joining this session. I think it's gonna be a really interesting session, especially because uh, uh, I've been in this market, the MFA market for almost 25 years, and it's the first time I've seen a, a report like that. I think we, I've never seen in my whole life uh, this type of comparison, this type of analysis, and, and made in a so, so deep and thorough way. I think it, you're gonna really like what you're gonna see in here. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to start with a poll question. Uh, how many cyber attacks involve the use of stolen credentials? How, how many uh, do, you, do you think? All right, 30%, uh, 50%, 80%, 90%. How many cyber attacks involve the use of stolen credentials? How many do you think, just before we get started in here, just to hit it up? The results, 48% uh, uh, said that 80% or more of cyber attacks involve the use of stolen credentials. I would say that the 80% and 90% are not wrong. Most of the attacks, I mean, almost all of the attacks we will use at some point uh, the stolen credentials for that. It can be by uh, conducting a phishing attack. It could be by uh, getting credentials from the dark web. There's there's so many ways, but uh, for sure, more than 80% of attacks we use at some point of the attack stolen credentials, okay? All right, so let's start with multi-factor authentication, the first step to identity security. MFA is, is like we always say, is a critical component of, of strong security. MFA is not everything you're gonna need, but it's one of the most important things uh, that you're gonna need, especially if you're implementing a zero trust project, is one of the first thing, things that you need to create trust is to identify the user. And MFA is the first step to identify the user. How do you create MFA with different factors? So uh, MFA, uh, Usually you have three factors, something you know, something you have, something you are, uh, and, and it can be a really a, a mix of a lot of things. Some people say 2FA, 2FA is when you have two factors, usually the, the password and something else. MFA, you can have multiple factors, which gives more credibility, more security to the solution. And uh, stolen credentials really lead, lead to data breaches across organizations. Uh, and that's how most of the attacks will start a lot of times through uh, uh, breaches and information that they gather in the dark web. Some of the market trends and requirements. Uh, one, one big requirement came from last year. There was this, this advisory from CISA, FBI, and NSA on the county ransomware. When they talk about uh, how the county ransomware was being deployed and how, how the county ransomware uh, or deployment can be prevented. So the, the main way they do that is through RDP connections. RDP connections to Windows servers. Once they get there, they deploy, they distribute through the Windows server. So uh, the advisory says that it's really important to protect RDP connections. Actually, it's it's mandatory for them. And every, any RDP connection uh, to server must implement multi-fact authentication. And most recently in, the, in this year, I think it was April or May, I, I can't remember that well, I was in a, a Gartner Identity and Access Management Summit in UK. It was my first uh, on, on presence event uh, uh, since the, the end of the pandemic. Uh, I, I ended, ended up with COVID for the second time, but uh, still it was a great event event and uh, I like I really like and I, I talk a lot with him and he opened his presentation saying that mode effect authentication is not optional it means that we're not coming here to this event to talk uh, if you need or not mode effect authentication we're maybe here to talk about what are the different options you have today but mode effect authentication is not optional anymore and one of the reasons is really cyber insurance so some of the, the trends are cyber insurance requirements uh, cyber insurance uh, since maybe uh, 
uh, to 2020, the end of 2020, we started seeing that. They started requiring MFA for almost uh, any kind of access. Started with email, remote access, uh, VPN, then RDP connections, any admin access to uh, routers, to, to firewalls, to servers. Every, everything in this matter needs to be uh, protected with MFA. And even those who had cyber insurance before, when they had to renew, they had to prove they have MFA in place, or they wouldn't renew, or either Pay a, pay a higher premium. So, uh, and this started moving, we started to see this year in Europe as well, but in US, you can't get a sub insurance if you don't have MFA. In fact, I looked at one of the, the offers, they say that if you don't protect your IDP connection with MFA, they won't protect you against ransomware. So they can change what the, the, the protections and the, some of the clause of the, the, the insurance, but most of the times they won't even protect you. And also vendor requirements. We've seen that with the tax to MSPs in 2019, we started saying, seeing like MSPs implementing MFA into their tools and even making those MFA mandatory. And other big companies like Salesforce, which in February this year, they announced that they're, they're going to start enforcing the use of MFA, which means that they're going to auto-enable MFA for anyone that has access to Salesforce. You have time to do that. So, uh, and, and you cannot do with SMS, you cannot do SMS OTP or voice OTP. They don't even, they don't even consider that uh, real MFA. You have to really protect if you want to do that. So we're seeing more and more companies just saying, okay, it's mandatory. We're not going to give you the option because we know that if you, we don't implement, there's a high chance you're going to be hacked at some point. And then this year, there was a joint alert between multiple countries. So uh, CISA in US, together with Canada, New Zealand, Netherlands, and UK, they, they launched this uh, advisory in May 17th. And I, I thought it was really interesting, like uh, weak security controls exploited for initial access. So they say, uh, in one of the things they mentioned is that identity is one of the major ways to get initial access. This is how they usually get access, using a stolen credential through phishing through the dark web, different things. And the first exploit is because MFA is not being enforced when accessing a protected system. So uh, they say that MFA, of course, it's mandatory and the zero trust security model adoption, it's one of the most important things that you can do to mitigate the risks associated with, with, with those attacks. And again, if we think about zero trust, this, this presentation is not about that, but one of the first things you have to do to create trust is to positively identify the user. And you cannot identify the user uh, with real trust if you're doing just with username and password. And now uh, I would like to pass because this is not about me. I think Marcon did an amazing job, something that uh, no company has done before. I think it, it's something that uh, took took a, a lot of time, a lot of work. They really wanted to go really deep into each each of the features. So I think it was a great, great job done by his team. And uh, we have the pleasure of having Rob Smithers here with us to talk a little bit about the results of this report. Rob? Alex, thank you so much for the warm introduction and, and the great overview of the importance of MFA and other solutions on the market. So, uh, you know, a good presentation. Uh, Really enjoyed uh, listening to that. So yes, uh, thank you, Rob Smithers, Myrcom. Uh, tell you about the, the, the fabulous work our engineers and WatchGuard engineers work together on in uh, producing this report. Uh, first of its kind, full industry assessment on uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, it's a rather lengthy report. It's like 76 pages. So uh, we have a shorter version, and I, and I promise I don't have 76 slides. I'm going to cut it down to the main points of the competitive comparison uh, that we conducted. But uh, some of the test cases uh, that we looked at, the different authentication methods, how well we can deploy uh, the product, doesn't matter just how good a product it is, can, can you actually get it out there and get people to use it quickly? Uh, provisioning and end user experience, very important. Overall security and uh, the risk-based authentication and total cost of ownership, bottom line, you know, one of, the, one of the decision making factors is going to be how much is this going to cost me and then what's the return on the investment after after putting in this product so uh the report's available both on the myrcom website and at the WatchGuard website for your uh reading pleasure it'll also be available at the end of the presentation we'll have some links and i believe liz will be sending you a follow-up on how you could 
get this report or how you could look at this uh, webinar a second time. So Liz will be sending that out. So we looked at three vendors uh, for this testing, not not just because you know we, we can only get three. There were, there were a lot out there. We were lo really looking at market leaders. Market leaders, what most people would be using. A lot of people have heard of uh, Cisco Duo. Of course, we've heard of Microsoft, Microsoft Azure, and their authenticator. Um, so we looked at the market leaders first and foremost, uh, paired them up against market leader WatchGuard for this review. So these are the different versions that we looked at. I know there's other solutions on the market. Um, that really have a hard time keeping up with these three. So these are the cream of the crop, the top three probably that to consider. Not to say there's not other solutions on the market. I mean, this, this those other vendors, but th these are the first three that come to mind for a lot of MSSPs. So that's why we chose to focus on them. And uh, they all have a, a lot of interesting uh, differences, advantages, and areas to improve. So let's go into how they actually compare. Um, first of all, we, we set up a real world environment. We set up a real world environment as if we were the customer with central MFA uh, cloud management. We created test users with mobile devices. Uh, we, we implemented hardware tokens when we could. Uh, we did use Windows Server. We did both a, a fully cloud deployment analysis as well as a hybrid. So maybe your servers are in the cloud, great. Maybe your mail's in the cloud, great. Some people still have premise solutions. Some customers have premise solutions. Some have a hybrid. So we looked at a, at a blend of things as uh, actual customers would be deploying it. And, and then we also looked at it from perhaps an MSSP. Maybe you're a reseller or you want to be a reseller. Hey, which of these solutions could I support and offer a better value to our customers? So we look at it both from the end user of applying this methodology as well as um, if you're going to be an advocate you know, for this technology and if you're going to be a, an MSSP, uh, managed uh, security service provider this is a you know these are products you might want to put under your belt so we, we look at those kind of considerations uh on the testing ah the jeopardy time poll question so uh, we're just going to take a quick pause and i'd like to know it would also help me adjust how i how i present which which of these definitions best fit your organization we're going to have like 30 seconds to vote uh but you know first and foremost you don't have an MFA, but you're currently shopping for a solution. Check that box if you'd like to be followed up on it. They're gonna to try to sell you stuff. Now, actually, if you are shopping for a solution, that would help me to know. Second option, you have a solution, but you're considering switching. I'd like to hear whoever's interested in that. And I'm, I'm curious, maybe put your questions or comments, you know, why you're thinking or what issues that you're having. Last point, I, I am an off point user, but I wanna learn about this report. So whether you're currently shopping, no, no, I am a, I am an MFA user, but I want to possibly switch. And lastly, I have off point, but I'd like to learn more. Oh, nice. Actually, that's a nice blend. That, that, that's a nice blend. Okay. So some of the key findings that we found in our testing, this pertains to the, uh, the WatchGuard off point. We found one of the smoothest sign on single sign-on portal setup and usage. It, it was very straightforward to, to set up and get implemented. We found the interface very intuitive, excellent help guides, actual, excellent support. Risk-based authentication and secure authentication contingencies were built in. Uh, pricing structure help keeps cost low. Now you're gonna see that that is a big factor. I have a part where we look at the overall cost of ownership at the end uh, and, and there's, there's a plan, there's a migration all the way from premise to cloud, no matter where you are in your current organization that you could follow. So some of those are some of the key, key takeaways from our observations and testing. So let's look at some of the specific items of comparison. And, and there were like 25 items of comparison, so many, but we're gonna highlight some of the areas that we think are important. So the single sign-on. You know, allow, allows users to use one set of login credentials across multiple platforms. Um, they all had it. They all had it. So, you know, kudos to all three vendors. But what we noticed when we were testing them, it was much quicker for WatchGuard to deploy. It was much quicker for a customer to actually use it for your uh, for your team to actually implement the product. So, if I had to redo this, I would say, okay, not just do you have single sign-on. How long does it take to actually implement that, install it, and, and use it? So, uh, so although they all had it, we did have a much 
quicker experience, quicker time to deploy uh, with the WatchGuard off point for a single sign-on. So they're not all the same, even though they have three greens. Risk-based authentication, adaptive security measures, adaptive system behavior, evaluating what users are doing. I, I tell you, WatchGuard has that in. Maybe, Alex, can you chime in a little bit on what WatchGuard is doing on the, the RBA? Because I know it has to yeah. how, how do you do it? Well, uh, uh, what the way we think is that, especially when you think about zero trust, is uh, okay. You need to use MFA, but MFA at some some point might not be by itself might not be enough. You have to use some risk factors. For example, maybe I want to create a, a a rule where you can authenticate, but only from from a specific country. I don't want people from different countries to authenticate. I wanna I wanna it, it work just during a specific time of the day. Uh, I don't want people connecting and using a system uh, outside business hours. Maybe I have different rules based on where I'm located, uh, my G GPS location, or maybe my network location as well. So we think that uh, those those kind of rules, they should be part of MFA. MFA shouldn't be deployed without risk-based authentication. This is why you're going to see that different from any other vendor, uh, risk-based authentication is available with just the basic license that you have with point because it's 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 really really important uh, anyone implementing uh, MFA you're gonna need risk-based authentication at some point and we 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 are creating a set of policies and, and you're gonna see much more much many policies in the future if, if you look at the Verizon data breach report that I just mentioned in the beginning they say that about 82 percent of the attacks they saw last year uh, had human errors on that and some human errors are related to for example or losing losing the password or or even approving a push uh, i i'm talking in here i receive a push i'm not even seeing it i just approve so this is a human error maybe approving a push that that's uh, being used by by an attacker so we are also creating some risk uh, uh, risk utilities that can mitigate these issues for example by uh, you know, the location of a computer and the location of a mobile phone if someone from a different country is trying to access the vpn maybe using a stolen credential that they found my stolen credential in the dark web uh, they might try to access i'm going to receive a push now my mobile phone is here the computer is another completely different location. Even if I approve, we're going to block that. So those are the kind of things that I think are really important when you talk about risk-based authentication. And we believe it should be part of MFA, which is different from other solutions that usually charge an extra for that. Loving that customization. I mean, you're, you're empowering the customer to, to, to provide added security measures through policies that a first-time user can understand. I mean, Alex, hats off to your team for, for allowing the customer to be more interactive rather than just saying, oh, WatchGuard, handle it. Customer can customize things for their level, for their security desires. Really fabulous. So RBA is definitely an advantage WatchGuard. Mobile DNA authenticate edition. Something unique and proprietary to WatchGuard, AuthPoint solution. It ensures authorized users can access online accounts and assets from their mobile devices. Completely unique, mobile DNA. Uh, so. It's not re replicatable by a hacker. Um, you can't e emulate it. It's a very uh, excellent way for authentic authenticating users uh, with the unique DNA. It's acquired information during the activation period. It's stored in the cloud, and it can use across all platforms. So it, it prevents hackers from posing, uh, from imitating uh, the users. So it's great that it's a multi-factor authentication, but this actually prevents somebody from imitating an authorized user and trying to de defeat the MF MFA. So this is an added level of security where uh, if you are trying to, if you will, hack the MFA, if you're trying, like I know you have that, I really, really want to get in. This prevents, uh, makes it much, much extremely more difficult to break in to the MFA solution. Alex, anything to add on mobile DNA that, uh, watch part? Yeah, yeah, I think the interesting thing about the mobile DNA, something that we create is a technology that we created uh, uh, even before my, my previous company was acquired by WatchGuard in 2017. It was something that was created because our customers at that moment were uh, mostly banks, financials, and they had, uh, as you can 
as you know, where where there's money, there's the the the, the attackers and the fraudsters. So there was a, a a lot of requirements that were put by the banks, and they were afraid about uh, cloning the token, cloning the application, and cloning the token. So we created this DNA uh, feature as one more factor. Again, I mentioned that MFA, you can have multiple factors. DNA is one more factor. It's, it's, it's about your phone. It gets information, hardware and software information from your phone and creates this unique DNA. So if you try to clone the, the, the information from your phone, uh, your token will, will not work or generate different OTPs in a different phone. So this was something that we created to, to prevent cloning, and we use that in Authpoint, which brings much more reliability and security to the app itself. I, I know it frustrated our white hat engineer customers uh that that we could not infiltrate watch guard so fabulous job hats off to mobile dna and i think it's time for a poll question all right jeopardy question of the hour what do you value most in a multi-factor authentication solution what do you think is most important to you uh, for an mfa solution your user experience the advanced features price ease of deployment so which is the most valuable to you? And the results, the user experience. Very good, some advanced issues, price, easy deployment. Okay, very good, so uh, overall user experience and that easy deployment, very important as well. So a nice mix of things. Yeah, bottom line, if you can't get it deployed, it's not gonna be much good to people and the overall user experience. Nothing like rolling something out that the administrators and the users don't like to use. Boy, I wouldn't want that egg in my face. So I, I would agree. Uh, Price is less of a concern, but it's still a consideration. Maybe not to you, but maybe the person buying it or paying that, you know, that, C, that, that uh, CFO or whoever approves purchasing and then the on-term on -term cost. So um, I, I think they're all important, but uh, understand and tend to agree. Uh, unfortunately, we only let you pick for one. So hardware tokens. Hey, one thing I'd like to add on, Myrcom has a has a adjunct MSSP where we where we did an installation recently with uh, WatchGuard Offpoint, and our customer required a hardware token. Love the app, love love it on the phone, love the multi-factor authentication through uh, traditional means, but but the hardware token was really really important uh, to have as well, and. Uh, we could only support that natively with WatchGuard. The other solutions, we had to implement a third party, pay more money, do some other things. They could support it, but I had to build it. I'm like, well, then that's not, you really don't support it inherently. Um, so uh, we found WatchGuard had a better opportunity for that real-time de deployment efficacy. Um, yeah, but, and I think this also resonates well with the, the last poll question. You gotta be able to deploy it. It's gotta be easy to use. Um, they have to trust, users have to feel trust with the uh, the work tools and, and that they're gonna be using. So uh, an easy to deploy solution, less time troubleshooting, that's all part of the uh, um, value with the uh, the WatchGuard Authpoint MFA. We also like that quick startup guide. Security hardware tokens, another unique thing. It's like, well, geez, who wants to have those little hardware dongles anymore? Some customers do. And, it, and it's also another, it's a backup mechanism, an emergency mechanism. I, my phones are down. I can't access the internet from it, whatever the issue may be. Having that hardware token as a backup is, is a unique uh, capability for WatchGuard. And uh, our customer actually demanded it, which really made the shot group a lot smaller and who they should consider. So you might be able to implement hardware tokens with some other uh, solutions, but again, it's it's third-party implementation, it's integration, it's more money, it's uh, uh, you know, so you're adding in complications to the level layers that aren't inherently built in. So you also have to consider where the tokens are made, token time drifts, security of token secrets. So hardware-based one-time passwords are most commonly and widely used. Um, token secret keys can be hacked. So tokens are, so, so there's a lot of differentiation between them, but we, we still have uh, hardware tokens available for with the WatchGuard solution. Alex, anything to add on the security of the uh, token? Yeah, yeah. One, one interesting thing, I, I, like I mentioned, I've been working for 
25 years and my first experience with with hardware tokens and with mfa was was with uh, and uh if you're not <laughs> my age or if you're younger than me you probably won't remember was uh, there was a company called security dynamics which then acquired our saying that they they changed the name and at that time those tokens were used to to for remote access using modems <laughs> So it was really, really old stuff. But I, I'm not here to talk about that. But I think one of the most important things that we learned since that time is that uh, one token is different from the other, right? I mean, what makes this, a token different from the other? Is its internal key? Is a secret key, or we also call the seed, the seed value inside the token. So if you have the seed, if you know the algorithm that runs, and today everybody uses the same algorithm that it was created through an organization called Oath or Open Authentication or Initiative for Open Authentication. Almost everyone uses that. So the most important thing you have when you're deploying a hardware token solution is the seed. You have to make sure that those secret keys, those seed are always protected. Uh, what what really uh, uh, caused me caused me like I, I was really impressed uh, in a negative way to see that uh, other vendors are still importing that they're importing those seed records completely open. I mean, it's, it's it's in plain text, so it's a file with all the seeds in plain text. That means that anyone with access to to this file, and at least one, the, the person who's importing has access to this file, can create easily create software clones. You can go uh, download the RFC. There's a Java code to generate OTPs. You just get this uh, clear test uh, seed, uh, put it there, and then you have a, a, a software version of this hardware token. This is this is uh, amazing in a bad sense. You shouldn't you should never ever like have those seed records in open text. That that's why we have our own hardware tokens. Of course, we manufacture. We send the, the keys directly to the cloud, but we also support third party hardware tokens. We just require them to be in a the protective form, which is PSKC, where you have a, an encrypted file and an, a key to decrypt this file. And then usually this has to be sent to two different people during the import process, so you never see the seeds in clear test. That's the, the secure way of doing. But we, we've seen that uh, the other vendors are still using like in clear test. And so security is something, not MF, all MFA is equal. You have to look at the security of each one. And this RSA article that, that you mentioned, it's when uh, someone got inside. It, it was a very specific attack to RSA. They got inside the network. They were able to, to get seed records so they could clone uh, the tokens and at that time our say they worked very fast to redeploy the to harder tokens worldwide. It was like millions of tokens, but they did all this to just to get those those seed records. Now imagine if if now we're just sending seed records away in clear text. I think this is a very bad practice, and this is something you need to consider if if you're. Uh, choosing hardware tokens because you think it's more secure, uh, just make sure the seeds are not in clear text. This is the this is my consideration in here. Or not don't use solutions that won't accept a protected way with a transport key and an encrypted file. Very good, sir. Very good, sir. So um, I'm uh, very pleased and honored to uh, conduct this review with our engineers and uh, definitely an advantage for uh, token use for WatchGuard. So we looked at a lot of criteria. I think we hit like maybe six like important parts, you know, summarizing things. But, and there's a lot more in the report that uh, Myercom and WatchGuard engineers uh, derived. But if I had to sum everything up, if I had to sum everything up and just say, look here, and, and this isn't like, oh, uh, the ability to reach the vision and the uh, the ability to pontificate the future. No, this this is a graph with quadrants that is meaningful meaningful to the world. So on on the uh, bottom on the x axis, we're talking about the overall cost of ownership for five thousand users a month. Like, what's it going to cost me to implement this solution? Overall cost, all costs considered to deploy the solution, implement the solution for five thousand users. As it's less expensive, you'll go to the right. So vendors with solutions should go uh, to the right on this graph. 
how well does it work is the other thing. So I, I said, well, what are the two most important things that consumers are concerned with? You know, they want a good value of the project, they, the product. They want it to work well. They want it to be secure. They want it to be efficient. They don't want it to be a bottleneck. They want it to be easy to use, easy to deploy. Lots of criteria, maybe 100 points of detail. Go into the quality of experience, your user experience using the product, and how good is the product? So how good is the product scale is on the left side, zero to 100. So the higher you're on that scale, the better the product is for you, the user, the implementer. The further over the right is the more cost effective it is. And overall, overall cost, not just the initial licensing. So you wanna be in that upper right quadrant of the market impact analysis grid. And uh, watch guard, you seat yourself very, very well. I don't know what we can do to get that cost even a little bit more, you know, less than a dollar per user. But in all seriousness, very well, very well priced. And the overall uh, accumulation of all things considered uh, makes WatchGuard Offpoint a, an excellent purchasing decision uh, and a huge, you know, huge cost advantage as well. But so, so one of the things that we, we like to see is, well, OK, so you could save a lot of money. But am I sacrificing features or functionality? No, you actually have more features and functionality compared to Azure and uh, Duo Access there. So um, we like this summary chart. You'll be seeing more of it. And uh, hats off to WatchGuard. So this is the single point summary of pretty much everything we've talked about. So we want, you know, congratulations to Alex, the whole WatchGuard team, all the engineers and the MSSPs involved in the MFA capabilities and, and the, that was proven by WatchGuard Offpoint multi-factor authentication. It, it proved competitively superior in provisioning, authenticating, authenticating, deploying, security testing, and it certainly had the Mar it certainly earned the Maricom Performance Verified Award. It's also won the Maricom Certified Secure Award because uh, we, we finished the penetration testing, the white hat testing against the product. So it's actually won two awards. We just presented that at Black Hat last week, as a matter of fact, which is a wonderful uh, surprise. So hats off to you and your team. So final final use. So a lot of great questions, and we'll, we'll continue to get to those that we can and those that we don't get to. Um, Liz has a way that we can follow up with you individually. So if we didn't get to your question, we will. We will follow up with you in email. Uh, and, and answer your unique question. Um, and I, I would just ask you, you know, when, when using a re report, final, final thoughts for how to use a report to assess existing MFA solutions, you know, learn about the critical features that, that you need. Uh, and I, I want you to look at the report and look at features that, wow, I didn't even know that was in there. So my, my view and understanding of MFA has changed immensely. I'm like, wow, I had no idea all this was under the hood. Um, but I would start with, hey, what do we need as an organization? You know, we need these three or four things. I want you to take a look at the report and look at all the other criteria. Is this important? Is this important? Oh, yeah, that's important. Oh, wow, that is important. I didn't even know it was important to me. So the, the critical advanced features in a solution is really what's going to differentiate the product. So when you, if you do a simple comparison, do they have single sign-on? Yes, they all have single sign-on. But are you concerned with deploying the single sign-on and having it actually work inside of several minutes instead of days. Well, yes, I am. There's differentiating things and levels of granularity. And there's things that, again, you, Alex, after spending all this time in this industry and his, and his team, part acquisition, these guys are experts. They know what the heck they're doing. So there is a lot under the hood, which is important to you and actually is an important feature to you that you don't even know that's important to you yet. So long story short, take a look at the report and all that criteria and ask yourself, yeah, is that something that could pertain to me? I think you're going to say yes. And rest assured uh, that is handed well on the WatchGuard solution. Do your own research. We're an independent lab. Uh, we're proud of our work. We're not perfect, but we're proud of our work. If I missed a certain criteria, please let us know. One thing I'll tell you, we didn't omit anything. We didn't say, oh, you know what? We're not going to put this in the report because WatchGuard didn't do well. Look, I, I was actively looking. Now I can say this. We were actively looking for things to trip everybody up. And everything we put on there, um, WatchGuard, you know, stood up to the challenge. So, I, you know, kudos to them. But, um, you know, you do your own research, look around there. And then you also want to look at, I think you'll see by the character of our writing, the stuff we're showing, we're really trying to do full disclosure on everything that we found on it. Um, 
not perfect, but I, I don't know a more complete analysis done for MFA solutions on the market, not to toot our own horn, but if there was one, I probably would have read it and tried to implement some of it. And uh, unfortunately, there was not a lot of uh, good solid work done, but uh, do your own research on it and uh, enjoy the report. And please reach out to your MSSP, reach out to WatchGuard, your tech people, and uh, see if you can get a uh, get this uh, solution implemented in your own organization. Oh, and you can get this report all over the place at the very low cost of a click. So you don't have to pay the pay for the report. We don't charge. We never charge. So WatchGuard is hosting it on their website. So if you want to go there for download, and you can also access WatchGuard by our com, com slash WatchGuard. So you'll find information on uh, this report for download. Um, we don't spam on uh, either this WatchGuard, but you have the options to opt in, opt out of things. And you'll also see lots of other reports for WatchGuard, other products that we looked at at Wirecom Comcast WatchGuard. Um, anyone on this webinar that registered, you're going to get messages to follow up on how you can download that report as well. Alex, do we have any more questions we got to hit? Yeah, we, we have uh, Fabio, uh, who works with me, is helping me as, answer those, those questions. There's a lot of questions. I think one, one that uh, it was interesting that that uh, that was related to the poll and something you said, I thought it was interesting. Uh, uh, they said that uh, about what do you look when you're looking for MFA solution? Price, use, use, uh, ease of use. And one, one answer that, well, different answers on that one. For my boss, it's going to be always price. <laughs> And that for me, user experience and ease of deployment. So, uh, uh, like you said, I mean, different people of the company might have uh, different things. Of course, if you're the CFO, you're going to be looking for the cost. And uh, for, for them, it's user experience and, and ease of deployment. And I, I think security is also one thing that we always have to, to, to be looking at as well. How secure is the solution? Again, not all MFA is equal. There was a question about uh, using email OTPs if I want to sell send an OTP by email. So we know that's that's not very secure. Uh, you cannot use with OutPoint. With OutPoint, you cannot use SMS, voice, or email OTPs because they are really easy to hack today. Um, even Salesforce, I would recommend, uh, I, what I like about Salesforce, they have a very long FAQ and uh, it talks about the MFA, which type of, what type of MFA are, are supported or which ones they recommend. And they said, well, the ones we don't accept is SMS, email, and, and voice uh, OTP because they're not secure. But you're gonna see also like different things. I, I think the, the report is great because it has great findings like like this thing about the, the seed records, but also that uh, some vendors, just a few, but some vendors are still using event-based OTPs, which is different from time-based. Time-based is when it changes uh, from every 30 seconds or every 60 seconds, the OTP changes. Uh, so it, it can be used in a very limited amount of time. Uh, event-based OTPs, and you know it's event-based when you click the button of the hardware token or mobile token, and it keeps generating new OTPs every time you click. And you can just make an experience, and then you you figure out how the hacker attacks. They're gonna they're gonna try to get as many OTPs as they can. Just just write it down. Start generating OTPs. Write it down in a piece of paper in this order. And then next time, next day, you want to authenticate, take this piece of paper. Don't even look at your phone for the OTP. You're going to be able to authenticate with the OTPs you wrote down in paper. You just scratch the one you use, and then next day you can use the next one. Attackers will do the same thing. They try to get as many OTPs. So as long as they're using the, the same sequence, they're going to be able to hack you uh, multiple times. This is why event-based tokens, I mean, this was... Down in 2003, one of the projects I was working with banks, they said, okay, event-based tokens are not accepted for banks because of this vulnerability. But we still see just a few vendors, but some vendors still use. So uh, security is also important when you choose uh, some of those things you can find in the report. You know, Alex, it's interesting you mentioned the, you know, not supporting the SMS base for OTP, but 
our, our white hat engineers, they were salivating at, yeah, we know how to crack this baby. And uh, you guys were already two steps ahead of them. It's like, look, you can't even do that. Uh, so we had a, a lot of known vulnerabilities, uh, you know, for, for hacking with SMS o OTP. And uh, it was good to see that you guys were already ahead of the curve on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also a lot of questions regarding integrations, outpoint integrations. I think you have a you you have a, one of the items of your report. I remember you checked about which kind of integrations, how many vendors. We have a list of more than 150 documented integrations that you can check in our website. It's 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 completely open, so you don't have to have an account with us. So it's just like a recipe: how you integrate, how you configure the third party product and what you need to do to configure Authpoint. There was a question about Microsoft 365. You have an option there. There's an integration guide for that. There's another one about OWA. OWA and Exchange, they don't support uh, modern authentication is what Microsoft calls when you, you launch a browser to authenticate. So we, we do that through a DFS. Uh, so there, there are several ways to, to integrate. You can check out in our website. I'm just going to to go. I was going through some of the questions, and I thought some some of those were really interesting here. So I just wanted to to talk about one of the questions. And actually, I think I I, I saw two different questions related to the same thing about this thing that was announced by by Microsoft, by Apple, and Google, if I'm not mistaken, about working together to to provide like a passwordless solution. And it's really interesting because passwordless, and, and when I talk about Gartner IAM, passwordless is a big topic. So FIDO2, I think it's a, it, it, it's a consortium that's building up some of those passwordless uh, solutions. Right now, it's, it's very limited in terms of what you can use. Uh, 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 a most of the times, the only thing you can use is a hardware token, a connected hardware token. So you're going to have to pay 50, 60, 70 dollars for a, a, a connected token, and then use that to connect to uh, to a passwordless enable application like Microsoft Office 365, for example, or to log into the computer. But it's still limited in terms of the applications you can do. It would be great, and this was when they announced it would be great if they had some some sort sort of work in progress between them but we haven't seen a lot uh, a lot about that i don't think this is going to replace uh hardware tokens it won't even replace mobile tokens uh, because uh companies and applications will have to adopt this kind of solution they have to adopt they have to become fido enabled and again the, one of the the main critics is that there are not many applications or fido to enable applications with the mobile phone or accepting that if you try to replace your authentication to to windows or to uh, azure uh, with with fido you have you only have the option of a usb token so it's um it's a work in progress. There's a long way to go. Uh, of course, we're going to support FIDO as well at some point, but we're, we're just seeing that it's not there yet. It's just very limited use cases that you can use. And most of the times it requires you to buy a connected hardware token, which is not easy. It's the cost of that, is the cost to send to the user now. Still, a lot of your employees are remote. So uh, I think passwordless is a great thing. And also biometrics could be another option, but the biometrics option right now is not shared between the applications. I think it's one of the, the the, the biggest issue you have today, uh, if I use biometrics in my Samsung phone, I cannot use the same one to log into my bank and my computer. Until this happens, I cannot share this biometric uh, type of application, okay? Uh, use enabling MFA, but the user is not willing to install the app on their mobile device or use a hardware token. Then you have to put a problem with this user because, again, most how do you create trust? Talk about zero trust. How do you create trust? You have to create with MFA. If if there's no different options for the user, if the user is not willing to get access, 
honestly, you shouldn't get, give access to this user. Uh, we, we're creating some, for example, our mobile app, we added the possibility of adding your, your third-party uh, OTP tokens. So you can use also for your personal use to access your Gmail account, LinkedIn account. I do that. Uh, in a couple of months, we're going to have an option that you, you're you going to have, have the capability of using it as a password manager as well. And not only for corporate use, but you're going to have a vault just for personal use. So we're giving more options for users. So uh, 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 to, to create more interest you know, on installing something like that, even if it's their personal phone. But if they are not willing to use either of those solutions, then you shouldn't compromise your security. Okay. Uh, there's a question, there's some questions about cloning and DNA. Uh, what happens if you clone the, the, the phone? What's going to happen is that you're going to have a, a, a clone of the, the application of the application in another phone, but you won't see your, your off-point mobile tokens. You might see during the clone your third-party tokens because they're Google Authenticator-like tokens. So uh, this they don't carry DNA. It's just a standard using the seed record plus the time. So you might see that, but not off-point tokens. In any case, if, if you change, if it was cloned, I mean, uh, it, it cannot be used. If the user changed the phone, they have to securely migrate the, the tokens. But when we say migrate, the, the seed the, of this token always change when you do that. The seed is created uh, dynamically. Um, there's also some information, uh, some questions here about, uh, I, I think there was an interesting one in here uh, about one of the poll questions about uh, if you're using MFA, if you're, if you're going from MFA uh, to, to more than one solutions. And one here mentioned that they're using Microsoft's authenticator for Microsoft 365 and Offpoint for all the rest. This is a common use case because Microsoft Authenticator was really designed for Microsoft applications. It won't support RDP connections. It won't support protection of Windows servers or Mac OS login. So it's a it's a common application that you have that uh, you, you you could pos possibly use uh, two uh, tokens at the same time. That's that's something that can happen. Really, uh, it was a lot, a lot covered today. Um, I want to thank everyone that, that attended, and uh, you know, Alex, you and your team, uh, your assistance uh, on, on conduct the project appreciated. You know, please. Uh, this is, I, I believe this is a subject which is not giving, which is taken for granted, not really looked at. And I, I think organizations should look at, look at this very closely for how they're implementing MFA. It is important. It, mm. it is a weak part of the chain if you don't implement mm. proper solutions. So please, mm. please choose wisely. And uh, I hope you can use the research that we've come up with to uh, help you along your path to the correct, correct MFA solution for your organization. Alex, again, hats off and congratulations to you and your team. Thank you and great job. I think it's, again, it's a report I haven't seen before when we, we had this idea. Uh, nobody did this before. Uh, Marcon was, was the one that took this project and, and made it happen. So I think it's your pioneers in this era. I think it was a great job. And thank, thanks everyone that joined this, this webinar today. Thank you, Alex and Rob. Um, to the audience, given the number of questions, we will be sharing a Q&A document after this webinar. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And again, thank you, Alex and Rob.